Ryan, can you just confirm that my slide has focus? Yes. Thank you. Okay, welcome. And thank you for joining us in this fourth and final virtual event to mark Louis Braille's birthday and World Braille Month 2022. We hope that you've enjoyed this series as much as we've had putting it on. It's been so invigorating to be a part of so much energy and excitement around Braille and what it means for meaningful, equitable access to literacy for blind and low vision readers. This is rethinking, sorry, refreshing and rethinking Braille awareness presentations with a focus on equity and accessibility. My name is Adam Wilton, and I'm the program manager of the Provincial Resource Center for the Visually Impaired in Vancouver, British Columbia. I'll note from the outset that I myself, I'm not a Braille user. I use print as my primary literacy medium. My connection to Braille is as a teacher of visually impaired students and a longtime Braille enthusiast. I'm delighted today to be joined by my two wonderful colleagues, Karen Brophy from the CNIB Foundation and Jen Jesso from PRCDI. Each will let you know a bit more about themselves when we reach their section of the presentation. Let's move to slide two. So before we start, as with all online conferences, please follow good etiquette by keeping yourself on mute when you're not speaking. So if you're on an iPhone, this control is located in the bottom left corner of your screen. Alt A to toggle on and off on a PC and option A on a Mac. Use the raise hand option when you have a question. Double tap on your name and the participants list on an iPhone, I, uh, sorry, iPhone, <laughs> or go into the more tab and find raise hand there. It's Alt Y on a PC and Option Y on a Mac. We are, however, going to save the use of um, voice chat until our Q and A or question and answer period at the end of this presentation. Um, we will we'll use the chat feature though for urgent questions and comments, um, as well as to respond to a few polls that we have for you today. Also to mention the informational part of this session will be recorded, so we are recording right now, and will be later posted on the Braille Literacy Canada YouTube channel. We will stop recording prior to the question and answer portion. Moving to slide three. The World Braille Day planning organizations acknowledge the historical oppression of land, cultures, and original peoples in what we now know as Canada. We respect and affirm the inherent and treaty rights of all Indigenous peoples across this land and will continue to honour the commitments to self-determination and sovereignty we have made to Indigenous nations and peoples. Please take a moment to acknowledge the lands on which you live, work and play. Slide four. Braille Literacy Canada, the Canadian Council of the Blind, the CNIB Foundation, the Centre for Equitable Library Access, the National Network for Equitable Library Service, and the Provincial Resource Centre for the Visually Impaired had a lot of fun working together and are pleased to deliver this series of events during the month of January in celebration of World Braille Day. And of course, it wouldn't be a presentation on Braille without a, an inspiring quote from Louis Braille himself. Begin quote, access to communication in the widest sense is access to knowledge. We must be treated as equals and communication is the way we can bring this about. Braille is knowledge and knowledge is power, end quote. We'll move to slide five. Acknowledgement to traditional territory. Before we start with an overview of the plan and purpose for today's presentation, Jen and I would like to gratefully acknowledge that we are presenting to you today from the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Salatooth, and Squamish nations. This is where PRCVI is based and where we're grateful to both call home. Pictured on the slide is the Vancouver city skyline with the North Shore Mountains in the background with the emblems of the three nations superimposed onto the image. Slide six, what we're here to do. We have a few goals for our presentation today. The first of these is to review some of what are perhaps more familiar practices and materials for raising braille awareness among members of the print reading community. The purpose of this review is not to be comprehensive, but to give 
us a hopefully familiar starting place from which to broaden our consideration of Braille awareness activities to include elements that promote equity in the learning community. One key message that Jen, Karen, and I hope to bring today is the importance of seeing Braille awareness activities as critical opportunities to engage learners and other educators in the shared project of accessibility and inclusion. To that end, we'll provide some suggestions for how to make this connection for learners from across the kindergarten through grade 12 years. Our focus is going to be participatory in that Braille reading students and mentors are engaged in the co-design of this programming, not just as co-presenters, facilitators, or special guests. Slide seven, presentation outline. Before we forget a very happy Family Literacy Day today, I think it's very special that we can get together on a day celebrating the uh, literacy related activities and family engagement. But first, let's start by getting to know who's here with us today. We have a Zoom poll that Rianne is gonna help us launch. And so when you see that come up in a minute, please take this moment to complete the poll. While you're doing that, I'll just mention that we recognize that we come to this webinar today with multiple intersecting professional and personal identities. So please select the option that best represents you. And we'll take maybe 30 seconds to a minute for that to, for everyone to complete that. Okay, I am going to end just a the note, Adam, oh, that, yes. um, that the poll is anonymous. Ah, wonderful. Thank you for uh, confirming that, Rianne. Yes, we just want to get a sense of who all is with us today. Okay, not seeing many more coming in, so I'm going to end the poll there and share out the results. So as you can see, the majority of participants identify as teachers of visually impaired students. We have um, some resource and inclusion support teachers with us. We have some librarians or library staff. Welcome library folks. Um, and we have a student, welcome. All right, thank you. This helps to get, this, this will help us in terms of our discussion and some of our examples later on. All right. Back to our presentation outline. Let's, we'll start with an overview of the rationale for planning to raise awareness of Braille and what this means for learners, essentially asking, why do we do these things? Next, we'll look at some more familiar approaches to Braille awareness that focus on sharing an understanding of the history, function, and utility of Braille for, for uh, the uh, peer or peers in the class who read Braille. As I mentioned at the end of the previous slide, the central methodology of this work today is participatory, meaning the student and any Braille reading mentors that are engaged play um, meaningful roles in all parts of the design process. We'll provide some strategies for implementing co-design in Braille awareness presentations. Finally, we're very important to have Kai Lee, one of our colleagues who is also a post-secondary student with a great deal of experience uh, in these type of learning opportunities first as a student himself, and now as a professional working in the accessibility space. Uh, Kai will join us towards the end of our presentation um, and before our question and answer section for a brief discussion. I'm now delighted to pass things over to Jen. Thanks, Adam. My name is Jen Gesso, and I'm a teacher of visually impaired students and also the Vision Outreach Coordinator here at PRCVI. Um, I have low vision myself, and I, I use dual media, so both print and Braille on a daily basis. And so slide number eight here is a cover slide and it shows the title, Raising the Profile of Braille in Learning Communities, uh, running across the bottom. And the rest of the slide is uh, taken up with a large picture of hands exploring a tactile bar graph with Braille labels along the top and down the side. And in the next few slides, we'll talk about the benefits of raising awareness of Braille for students who read Braille, for peers who read in another medium, as well as for educators. So slide nine. Uh, so first there are benefits for students who read Braille. Um, and on this slide, there's a picture of a student reading Braille with a teacher sitting next to her. And um, the picture is from the BC Regional Braille Challenge. 
And the theme that year was space. So there's also a planet and a rocket ship blasting off that are both superimposed on the picture. So the first way that raising the profile of Braille in the learning community is important for the student who reads Braille is that it supports the development of self-esteem and self-advocacy skills. And these are both critical skills for blind and low vision students to develop beginning as early at a, as early an age as possible. Uh, so participation in Braille presentations allows Braille readers to take part in sharing an aspect of their learning that is important to them and in helping to advocate for the importance of accessible literacy and resource materials in their schools and communities. Another reason why it's important to raise the profile of Braille for students who read Braille is that it helps to dispel misconceptions about Braille. In most environments, there is much less Braille available than print. Uh, and because blindness and low vision is a low incidence in childhood, um, peers who are sighted may rarely have an opportunity to see Braille in the environment or being used by people. Uh, and so presentations that wear, raise awareness of Braille can help to clarify things like uh, the fact that Braille is not a language um, or that Braille can be used to represent um, materials, including math and tactile diagrams, for example. A third area where uh, Braille users can benefit from raising the profile of Braille in their learning community is by promoting um, the experience of the equivalence of print and Braille. Um, in this case, peers can learn that reading Braille is just reading. Uh, it's just that print happens to be a visual reading system and Braille is a tactile reading system. And furthermore, Braille users may benefit from researching and presenting on adults who use Braille in a wide variety of careers and activities. And raising the profile of Braille can also help to build a better understanding and appreciation among peers and educators of the unique features of Braille reading and writing. So for example, Braille materials depend on formatting to convey structure rather than size or color. And tactile graphics need to be carefully rendered to be usable. And finally, raising the profile of Braille in the learning communities can provide Braille users with greater confidence in articulating barriers to access to information and poten potential solutions. So for example, once their learning community understands how Braille uses format to convey structure, it can make it much easier for a Braille user to convey the importance of being provided with digital learning materials that are formatted with proper styles instead of font sizes or colors. Uh, color changes alone. And so we'll move on to slide number 10. And this is uh, the how raising the awareness of Braille within learning communities can also be important for peers uh, who read in another reading medium. And uh, this slide has a picture of two teachers at the front of a classroom referencing some text being projected on the wall while presenting. And students at their desk each have a Perkins Braille writer and are working um, individually as they are at their desks. And when thinking of peers, we don't want to assume that peers in the classroom are using print as their primary reading medium, as they may be using other formats to access literacy. So Raising the profile of Braille can help to foster empathy and perspective taking among students and broaden their awareness of the and understanding of the diversity in their classrooms. Each student has unique learning needs and by building this awareness, students can work to make their environment more inclusive to everyone in their learning community. Increasing awareness of Braille can also help peers appreciate that Braille is functionally equivalent to print. So for those of us who use Braille, it is not a special code or dots that are interesting to feel. Um, Braille is just a different tactile way of reading that is functionally equivalent uh, to visual reading with print. Um, and peers who are Braille users 
uh, kind of de develop the awareness of this fact and the fact that anything that they need in print, a Braille user needs, needs access to in Braille. Raising the profile of Braille can also help peers to have a frame of reference when encountering Braille in their communities and in the media. Many, may, many peers may be aware that Braille is um, available in places such as elevators and signs, but they may not know that everything from bills to federal and provincial election ballots are available in Braille. And this can lead to discussions around places where print is available, but Braille is not, and where further advocacy is needed. And finally, raising the profile of Braille can help to foster a sense of empowerment in, uh, for peers in creating more accessible work products. Um, so students have greater power to create materials and products that are fully accessible to both print and Braille users, um, especially when it comes to digital creations as we'll discuss later in this presentation. And so slide number 11 is going to discuss why raising the profile of Braille learning in learning communities benefits educators um, who do not specialize in working with students who are blind or have low vision. Um, so on this slide, we have a picture of an educator who's reading a Braille uh, story to a class at the front of the room. And the, it's a primary class of students sitting on the carpet uh, watching as this educator reads, and they have their own seat copies of this story that they are following along in as well. So increasing the profile of um, Braille can help educators to have a more accurate understanding of Braille as a writing system and the role of teachers of visually impaired students as literacy co-teachers. Educators become aware of the unique characteristics of Braille as a tactile reading medium, such as contractions and formatting rules that are crucial for learners to acquire. And a greater awareness of Braille can help awareness to have a better sense of the classroom teacher's uh, central role in ensuring um, timely access to materials that are, the, that are being used in the learning environment. So this understanding is the importance of correct formatting in Braille, for example, can help educators understand why it's important to work with certified Braille transcribers, as well as why it's necessary to has, have some lead time in order to produce high quality Braille learning materials for students. And finally, raising the um, profile of Braille within learning communities Uh, can develop an educator's understanding of the connections between disability history, accessibility, and diversity, equity, and inclusion programming. Um, the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion are gaining increasing focus in a wide range of areas within school communities, and accessibility is an important aspect of this work. And so slide number 12 is gonna to shift topics a bit, and we're going to give a review of some of the familiar tools and approaches to raising the profile of Braille within learning communities. And we're curious about what tools and approaches um, those of you attending have used if you've done classroom or community-based Braille awareness presentations. So uh, we're gonna ask you to share in the chat the answers to, to, um, to some of the tools and strategies you've used. And as I go through these slides, you can um, take a few moments to answer. And at the end of this section, we will share some of those resources. So on this slide, there's a screenshot of a Braille Writer Alphabet reference sheet that's available from PRCVI's website. And this resource shows that, uh, it shows a Braille cell with dot numbers and it also shows the six key Perkins style keyboard with each dot on and key labeled. And then below that is the start of the Braille alphabet and it's illustrating which keys to be pressed on the Braille writer to produce each letter. And so one of the main days of awareness presentations in classrooms is to share the story of Louis Braille. Uh, this story is quite compelling for students, especially when they find out that Louis Braille was only 15 years old when he created his code. And it's often conveyed in picture books 
um, or presented through um, slideshows or online resources or videos. Um, and the story of Louis Braille can be used as a starting point for more general discussions about equity and inclusion because Louis, of course, experienced some resistance from fully sighted professionals in the early days of his code. Another tool familiar to almost anyone who has made a presentation about Braille is having a classroom discussion about where Braille can be found in the community. This can be especially engaging for young students who may have seen or felt Braille in an elevator or signs or even the tactile markings on Canadian currency. And these dis discussions can lead into building awareness of the vast uh, variety of ways and Braille materials in the world. So there's everything from print Braille books to Braille music notation to complex tactile diagrams available. An activity that many of us has, have done is to work with classes in hands-on activities with Braille. And these can uh, vary depending on the equipment available um, to the classroom. And so class, a class might write their names in Braille, for example, using um, either fill, sort of fill in the dot sim Braille activity sheets, uh, or preferably they would have the opportunity to write on a Perkins Braille writer to produce their name. Uh, there are also online resources to teach classes about the basics of the Braille code, such as the Braille Bug website from the American Printing House for the Blind. This website contains both printable activities as well as accessible interactive online activities. Um, and Adam is putting these resources into the chat as well for anyone who wants to check them out. Um, so aside from the Braille Bug, there are many other crack the code type activities. Uh, activity packets available um, with activity sheets that allow students to decode Braille words and sentences. And now we'll move on to slide 13. Um, so here are some of our favorite picture books about Braille. And on this slide, we have a picture of the cover of the secret code book. And it's showing an illustration of a young boy reading a Braille book and a young girl with a print book sits behind him and is looking over his shoulder with a quizzical expression on her face. So The Secret Code by Adam Meachin Rowe is, uh, and published by Scholastic is um, a book about a young reader, a uh, young Braille reader um, who teaches his friend and classmate to read Braille. Uh, this book has one sentence of text per page and is great for younger grades and younger students. Uh, another title that we like is A Picture Book of Louis Braille by David Adler, and this is published by uh, Holiday House. And this tells the story of Louis Braille. It has more text um, than The Secret Code, but it is still short enough to read to a primary class. And finally, um, Six Dots, A Story of Long Young Louis Braille by Jen Bryant and published by Random House is another book that tells the story of Louis Braille. This picture book has a lot of text per page, and so it's too long to read in a short session. But what we've found useful is to pick out section, a section or two of the book to read. So for example, we've read um, part of the book that explains Louis' experience with, raised, um, uh, with books with raised type before Braille was available to illustrate why a Braille is a, tactile, a better tactile reading system and why a better system was needed. And so we'll move to slide 14. And this is just continuing talking about some of the um, activities that are tried and true. This slide has a picture of a diagram of a Braille cell with the dot numbers labeled. And then next to that picture is a picture of a six cup muffin tin with tennis balls used to represent the braille dots. So some of the other tried and, tool, tried and true tools and techniques used to illustrate braille in learning communities um, include active activities where students decode secret messages. And this can be done either with pre-made messages such as the activity sheets um, I mentioned earlier or by having students create messages themselves that they exchange with a peer to decode. Uh, students can use everyday materials to create braille cells, uh, such as ping pong balls, tennis balls, 
frisbees or hula hoops. And this activity can be a great way to provide a um, solid introduction to the braille cell and dot numbers in uh, preparation for students learning how to type on the Perkins Braille Writer. And finally, students can use a variety of everyday materials such as beans or bottle caps to create their names in Braille. And this activity can also include discussions about the importance of design and spacing um, in things like Braille, because of course in Braille, spacing is very important to ensure legibility. Um, so now we'll see what tools and strategies people have shared in the chat. So Jen, we, uh, we got a mention in the chat of the resources for learning Braille from the Hadley School in the US, uh, which is always a great source. Yes. Yeah. And uh, that's all we've got. Okay, so if there are no more, um, hopefully this has given some you some ideas. Um, and I'm gonna pass it now over to Karen, who's gonna discuss um, raising the profile of Braille within communities. Hi, Jen. Thank Hi. you so much. So my name is Karen Brophy, and I am the literacy lead for CNIB Foundation. As Jen mentioned, I'm going to be talking a bit about taking Braille awareness beyond the classroom out into the community. And to do this, I'm going to be sharing a few examples of programs and resources that we've used recently at CNIB Foundation and hoping that some of these might inspire you. Um, there are six photos on my slide and I'm going to start with the one at the top left. And that is a photograph of the reception area at the CNIB hub in Toronto. There's a colorful mural in the background on the wall and a bright orange couch. But the important things I wanna point out in this picture are the pillow on the couch, which has had buttons added to spell out the word enjoy, I think it is, in what I call button braille. And the braille light board, it's a bright blue light board that was made by one of our volunteers. It is quite large. It is made out of the push-on lights that you can get at the dollar store, which are about four inches in diameter. So one push-on light per braille dot. And it's actually about, I would say four feet wide. And that enables us to show eight braille cells. Um, and then the push on buttons are how you indicate which, uh, which dots are, uh, are enabled. So obviously it's, it's a very visual thing. Um, in this picture, the lights have been turned on to spell out book love. And that was used for a book launch that we were having at the hub. Um, and so, Although it is quite visual, a lot of family and friends have fun getting into pushing the buttons to spell out different words. And it's because it's so large, it is uh, something that can be seen by someone with low vision. So moving to the right, the next photo in the top row shows a signboard with the message, the cure for boredom is curiosity. And that is spelled out in black tactile braille dots. This was actually a DIY which we produced using adhesive Velcro dots. So the way this works is that one side of the Velcro dots is placed in the pattern of a braille cell on a large two foot by three foot foam core board. This is all material from the dollar store. And by laying out the braille cells, there's actually space on the foam core board to depict about 12 cells per line. And we've got four lines available if you use the small Velcro dots that you buy. And then the other side of the Velcro dots is used on the back of whatever you want to use to represent the tactile braille. So in the picture, what we did was we had small, this was a very early version. We had small styrofoam balls that we had a volunteer cut in half for us and then we painted them black and attached the Velcro on the back so that they could be attached to the signboard. We have since upgraded. We now use uh, the flat backed acrylic jewels that you can get at the dollar store. So it's in addition to being legible by touch, it's also very shiny. 
Um, so it's not necessarily a quick DIY. It, it is a bit labor intensive, but very useful. We use this sign at all of our events. And in fact, once you set up the layout for the spacing of the braille, uh, maybe marking the spot for the, uh, for the Velcro dots onto the signboard, this is a project that could easily be done by a group of students. And then you'd have it as a resource for the future. So the next slide to the right on the top row is a photograph of me. And I'm standing behind a display of Braille and Tactile that we took to something called MakerFest. And that was held at the Toronto Public Library. But in fact, these events happen all over the world, probably in your community too. And they are a magnet for creative and inventive people. They're sort of like a science fair or a DIY fair for the general public. And our Braille information table is always a big hit at events like this. We've hosted similar tables at literary festivals like Word on the Street, which is also offered at many, in many communities across Canada. And it's an opportunity for our participants who are Braille users to become ambassadors for Braille, talk about their experience with Braille with a very interested audience. The last photo in the top row on the right is a photo of a boy and his mom at a family community engagement day, which CNIB hosted in 2020, uh, about two years ago for the Braille Challenge. And it was a Braille carnival. And the activity that's pictured in this photo was what we called a Braille race. And this was where kids could compete against each other they could compete against TDIs or compete against their parents to see who could braille the alphabet the fastest. So very important to encourage and provide opportunities for families to get involved with braille literacy. On the bottom row, there are two photographs. The one on the left is a photograph of a little girl with a volunteer also at the braille carnival. And this particular activity was a scavenger hunt where the list of clues were handed out either in Braille or in simulated Braille for the kids who are sighted and just being introduced to Braille. And those clues led them to riddles, which were scattered throughout the Braille carnival in Braille on signs and a great opportunity for sighted kids to work alongside Braille readers. And the last photo in the bottom right is a classroom that shows some of the resources that CNIB sent out as part of a pilot project called the Print Braille Family, sorry, the Print Braille School Library. Uh, we included a large tactile Braille alphabet sign, a smaller version of the Velcro signboard that I described, a Dymo Braille labeler, and of course, some books for the Print Braille books for the school library because it's very important to have a good selection of books for Braille readers to borrow at school, the same as their classmates can. And hopefully tools like these would be used by educators to raise Braille awareness in the classroom, outside of the classroom, in the school, and beyond into the community. And that's what I had to say. Thanks so much, Karen. I really appreciated how the photos and examples that you shared illustrated a whole constellation of rich opportunities to engage and have fun with Braille, both inside and outside of classrooms. Essentially, there are so many potential connections to our efforts to raise the profile of Braille and what it means for learners, both at school and in the community. In this section of the presentation, we're gonna look at ways that students, TVIs and other stakeholders can extend the typical narrative of the Braille awareness presentation to connect Braille to equity in meaningful, timely access for blind and low vision learners and to the broader project of inclusion, asking the question, is there an opportunity to look beyond awareness and to situate Braille in equity and inclusion movements? Many of these examples uh, of lessons or, or in-class workshops are ones that Jen and I have delivered via outreach in BC schools predominantly prior to the outset of the current pandemic. Uh, in these examples, we use co-design, critical thinking, Braille technology, um, and, uh, and, and modeling to advance beyond awareness. 
And this is slide 17 next, centering user perspectives. As we mentioned earlier, our approach is participatory, meaning that we are looking for ways to engage Braille reading students and mentors at every step of the design process, not simply at the end as co-presenters. We can model the design process for students. On the slide, we see a diagram of the design process that begins where we empathize with users, then define, ideate, prototype, and test. This is an iterative process where we first understand the user perspective, define our goals for the lesson with the student, develop potential activities, create prototypes of those activities, and then test. And so testing can take on a number of different forms. We can test with a small group of students from that from the Braille reading students class. We can test with a small group of students from another class and then get feedback before implementing that with the student's entire learning community. And it's important to note as well that this process is cyclical in that we use the prop feedback from the testing phase to improve developments back in the empathize and design phase. So it's, it's a circle. To that end, we aren't looking for finished products. Um, and we found that this really appeals to educators because we're not only centering the student's perspective, but we're also actively modeling um, design thinking. And so we've got some examples of this later in our slides. Moving to slide 18, Braille fails. Many of you know Braille fail as a funda fundamentally ineffectual use of environmental Braille. For example, in the image on the slide, a door sign reads, caution, this door swings outwards. Please do not stand directly in front of doors. And this is in both print and Braille. So you can imagine how problematic that might be for someone reading that note in Braille. This is humorous to some, but inconvenient and discriminatory to Braille users who rely on accurate, well-placed signage that is in good condition. So does this mean that we dismiss these examples? Well, we've used Braille fails as a means of starting conversations with uh, communities of learners, particularly those at the middle and secondary levels around the true problem with inappropriately placed or poor quality Braille signage and what potential implications that might have for users. Critical in this are the perspectives of students and Braille mentors who take this from the hypothetical to the real life by reporting on how Braille fails negatively impact their travel experiences and provide potential insight into how they as users would respond. By applying critical thinking skills to the problem and attempting to understand the issue from the user's point of view, Braille moves from an awareness and novelty context into its true, more authentic socio-cultural context. What's most important here is providing these opportunities for peers, not, it's not to experience non-visual access themselves, but to build empathy through connections to prevailing notions of equity and justice. So slide 19 next, disability simulation. On the slide, the image shows a room of adults, many of whom are wearing sleep shades as they participate in a simulation activity. In talking about perspective taking and awareness, it is important to address the issue of disability simulation. Here I am referring to the practice of creating a condition or set of conditions where an individual's functional sensory profile is temporarily altered in an attempt to approximate the experience of a disability, in this case, visual impairment. If the goal of a Braille awareness activity is to encourage empathy and perspective taking, there may be a tendency to incorporate simulation activities into the lesson. However, it's important to note that there's growing evidence that activities that include simulations of blindness and low vision are not an effective means of building awareness and empathy. Research from Ariana Silverman, a blind researcher now working as a research specialist for the American Foundation for the Blind and her colleagues found that blindness simulations may in fact reduce participants' perceptions of the capabilities of blind individuals. In essence, simulations have the potential to work counterproductively to the aims of the activity. In addition to the effectiveness of simulation activities, we must also consider the significant caveats about the authenticity of the experience that must be provided to participants. Finally, consider involving Braille users in any decision-making process regarding simulation. While our intention here is only to give you some key considerations in the use of simula simulation activities when uh, raising the profile of Braille access, I can tell you that in our experience, simulations end up obscuring the purpose of the activity at best 
and at worst, reinforcing stereotypes and other misconceptions not reflective of Braille users' actual experiences. And now I'm going to send things back over to Jen. Thanks, Adam. So now this slide is connecting Braille to coding. And this slide has a picture of a screenshot with a sentence that says, this text is important with an exclamation point at the end. Um, and the words are in both print and sim Braille. And the print text is enclosed in um, HTML strong opening and closing tags, while the sim Braille text is enclosed in UEB bold type form indicators. Um, and so this um, Braille encoding connection comes from a request that we got several years ago to make a pres Braille presentation that had connections between Braille and coding. And this was from a um, teacher of visually impaired students and classroom teacher that were working on doing some coding in the classroom. Uh, so this led us to develop some presentations that used coding concepts to frame our discussion around Braille and accessible uh, digital content. Um, and so an example of this is that we use um, HTML or hypertext markup language um, as a lens to discuss Braille. And everything presented on websites is just plain text. And then HTML is used um, to mark that text up as so that it's when it's displayed in a web browser, it displays elements such as headings and paragraphs and emphasized words and so on. Um, and so this presentation begins with some slides that show print text with various elements such as headings and paragraphs and bold text. And we ask students to consider the purpose of each of these elements and how the element is distinguished from the surrounding text. So to provide an example, um, the purpose of a heading is to introduce the topic of the next of the text below. Uh, and the heading can usually be distinguished from the surrounding text by things like spacing and text size and text color. And um, in Braille, um, Oh, so then before we actually, before we get into the Braille, the class is introduced uh, to Braille and gets an opportunity to learn and practice the alphabets and write some things on the Perkins Braille Writer before, continue, before coming back and continuing the um, conversation around the idea of text purpose and presentation. So for example, once the students have learned the basic Braille cell and the Braille alphabet, um, we come back and we discuss what the purpose of a heading in Braille is. And the purpose of a Braille heading is the same as it is in print. It's to introduce the topic of the text below. But uh, because Braille is a set size um, and because it's a tactile reading system, size and color can't be manipulated in order to, to show a heading. And so instead Braille, a heading in Braille, it depends on position on the page to differentiate it from the surrounding text. Um, and type form indicators in Unified English Braille are used to denote text that is bold or italic, for example, and they are similar to HTML tags uh, that are used to denote text that is also emphasized or that has other um, semantic meaning that needs to be conveyed. Um, and so students are then introduced to the idea of universal design for digital materials. And this is the idea that a single file produced with proper markup in HTML or in another markup language can be used to generate material in print or Braille or other formats. Um, the formats use the same elements and they all have the same purpose behind them, such as headings or text that's emphasized. They're just presented differently depending on whether they are presented in, for example, a visual or a tactile reading system. Um, and one of the most exciting parts about this um, is that in the end, anyone can create digital material that is accessible to all if they follow good markup um, practices. And so just to summarize this, um, the Braille and coding um, presentations that we've done draw direct connections between STEAM content that students are learning, such as HTML coding and Braille. It introduces students to the idea of semantic markup or using styles and tags to convey the structure of the underlying document. 
it introduces students to concepts of accessible document design, headings, structure, and alt text. And finally, it emphasizes that Braille and print are representing the same information in different ways. And now I'll pass it back to Adam. Adam, I think you might be muted. Thanks, Jen. I was. <laughs> so I'm on slide 21. This is Braille today. Thank you, Jen. To carry on highlighting the connection between technology and Braille, we found it important to highlight access technology when presenting on Braille and accessibility. The image on the slide shows a user's hands reading the refreshable dis display of a Braille note touch. There is a diverse range of AT solutions for non-visual access to information in Braille, including refreshable Braille displays, Braille note takers, and looking ahead, refreshable tactile displays for exploring information on images and graphics. Depending on the grade level of the participants, we found it very helpful to, dis to uh, dispel the misconception that advances in artificial intelligence and other technological frontiers will somehow make Braille obsolete. While Braille technology can be very impressive to audiences, it is also important to emphasize that a range of options continue to exist, including hard copy embossed Braille, and that this remains a preference for many readers. Activities where participants have to think critically about their own access toolkits can help to foster an appreciation that there's not one single way to access information. Pens, pencils, compasses, rulers, calculators, iPads, and laptops are tools for gathering and organizing information in the same way that a Braille writer, Slayton stylist, or Braille note taker are for Braille users. The introduction of Braille technology also helps to build an understanding of the range of formats that users may engage with, including PDF, e-text, EPUB, MP3, and others. So not only are there multiple ways to access Braille, but there's also, also multiple formats as well. This is also an excellent opportunity to engage peers in the process of creating accessible content. There are numerous approaches that one could take here, from showing students how to use the accessibility checkers that are built into the software they use at school, such as those in Microsoft Office apps, to strategies for writing effective uh, descriptions for visual media. As students are both creators and consumers of digital content, this information is relevant so that all information in the classroom community is accessible, not just that which is provided by the classroom teacher, teacher of visually impaired students, or the Braille transcriber. Further, this means that content does not always need to be adult mediated when shared between a Braille reading student and their peers. In terms of resources, this is an area where there's not a lot available. And so this is something Jen and I are thinking a lot about these days, but if anyone has any suggestions for resources to teach document accessibility for K-12 learners, please do share them in the chat. Moving to slide 22. Some of our favorite books on access and inclusion. To add to Jen's list of titles related to Braille and the Braille code, here are some titles that feature, feature learner perspective and positive messaging around equity and justice for disabled learners. Pictured on the slide is the cover of Keep Your Ear on the Ball, featuring a child running towards a base in a game of baseball with a group of peers cheering behind them. First is We Move Together by Anne Mc McGuire and Kelly Frisch, published by AK Press. This is a wonderful book featuring depictions of disabled advocates, as well as children and adults using a range of uh, aids, tools, and devices in their communities. Next is My City Speaks by Darren LaBeouf, and this is published by Kids Can Press. This is a nice example of a book featuring a visually impaired character. In fact, Jen read this story in our uh, second Braille Literacy, World, World Braille Day uh, session. The story is not focused on the experience of the character as a visually impaired learner. However, the author did seek consultation with consumer organizations in writing this book to ensure the authenticity of the depiction. The third is Listen for the Bus by Patricia McMahon and published by Boys Mill, Boyd's Mill Press. This is an older title, but it's a nice example of a true depiction of the day of a day in the life of a student, David, who is a deafblind learner. Finally, Keep Your Ear on the Ball by Geneviève Petrillo is a story based on an actual, actual events, real students, um, and 
we like to highlight it because it features peers working together with their blind classmate to solve an accessibility challenge. And so as we wind down this phase of the presentation, we just want to talk about some of the examples of lessons that Jen and I have either delivered or would love to deliver when we're able to get back uh, full time into classrooms. Um, so this is again looking, beyond, looking to build beyond Braille awareness to connecting to equity and inclusion issues that are happening right in school communities. Um, so with one class, we engaged in uh, a, actually a series of activities that was a critical review of accessibility wayfinding signage in their school. And so working with their blind peer, small groups of students surveyed the school and, uh, and looked for instances where uh, there was signage that was not accessible um, or where there was no signage at all, and it should have been added for the benefit of all travelers in that school building, and then reporting those findings to teachers and to the school administration. Um, the other uh, lessons that we've been, uh, we've been thinking a lot about and developing uh, center on evaluating the digital accessibility of content and then working collaboratively to provide feedback to developers, recognizing that identifying and highlighting accessibility challenges for those who are developing content and digital infrastructure is not the sole responsibility of the disabled learner, that this can be a shared responsibility. Um, so there's that collaborative piece as well. Um, and then finally, looking critically at um, what we in British Columbia called a, call applied design skills and technology curricula, but you know that could be the, 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 you might use a different name in your jurisdiction, but looking at you know tools in that in that kind of design tech curricula um, and thinking about the accessibility of common tools and approaches like 3D printing, for example, and working collaboratively with peers to develop a plan to ident to address barriers that uh, that we might find in uh, in those learning areas. So I am going to just wrap now by saying by on behalf of Braille Literacy Canada, the Canadian Council of the Blind, the CNIB Foundation, the Center for Equitable Library Access, and the National Network for Equitable, Equitable Library Service and the Provincial Resource Center for the Visually Impaired. Thank you for celebrating World Braille Day with us. We will now stop the recording and um, join our friend and colleague Kai for a brief discussion on his perspectives on Braille awareness activities. Before we do that though, I will just mention our uh, contact information. So Karen is at Braille Matters on Twitter and at karen.brophy at cnib.ca. Uh, Jen is TVI underscore Jen on Twitter, and she her email is uh, jjesso at prcvi.org. Um, and uh, I'm at TVI Adam on Twitter, and I'm at A Wilton at prcvi.org. And we will drop these into the chat um, when we have an opportunity, perhaps in the QA. Oh, pardon me. Did I get your email address wrong, Karen? Karen.brophy at cnib.ca. Okay. Yes, so there's an e. Thank you. Oh, pardon me. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll throw that in the um in the in the chat just because I know that's a lot easier when we get this type of information rather than having to furiously note it down. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen there. And I'm going to ask uh, Kai, have you joined us? Yep, I'm here. Wonderful. Kai, 